Hello and welcome to the Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guest is retired four-star U.S. Naval officer and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander Admiral James Stavridis and the author of a new book. This is about his, I think, 12th or 13th, To Risk It All. And remember, we love taking your questions, so write to politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, James, do you remember when Trump and allies like Jim Jordan were complaining about all the time and wasted resources of special counsel Robert Mueller, appointed by the Trump Justice Department, that he was wasted on the hoax of the Trump-Russian connection. Well, in less than two years, Mueller got 34 convictions, including Trump's campaign manager, the deputy campaign manager and national security advisor, and a report that left no doubt that the Russians sought to help Trump in 2016. The only question was whether you could prove collusion. Let's fast forward to today. And the counter move by Trump and William Barr to claim the real problem, the real hoax, was what the Clinton and Democrats cooked up to try to incriminate poor old Donald Trump. And they appointed John Durham to look into this. Durham has been doing that now for three years. That's a, a year longer, more than a year longer than Mueller. And what's he come up with? Nothing. This week, his big case, his big fish, Michael Sussman, uh, a lawyer uh, who worked with Democrats, was, uh, he had indicted him for lying to the FBI, lying to the FBI about who he was representing. Uh, it was really, if you look at it, it was a really a small fry charge to begin with. He was acquitted after six hours. That's all, that's all it took. And if you watch Fox News in the right wing, they would barely mention the acquittal and say this was a case that proved the Democrats did all these dastardly, terrible things. And look what John Durham is doing. John Durham is doing nothing. It's been an embarrassment. And it is time for the Justice Department to end this witch hunt uh, called John Durham. We should remember one of his top aides resigned a year and a half ago under uh, suspicion that uh, she thought it was too political. So that's truth in packaging with John Durham. And I'd invite our listeners to just photo John Durham. And, you know, sometimes the photo says a thousand words. This photo says one word blaringly, asshole. He looks like one. He looks like as big an asshole as he is. And it, it, David Kendall, who is reportedly a pretty fair country lawyer, had a piece in the Post today just how, how weak and stupid this case was. And you and I know this because we talked to you more than I do, we both talked to a number of people in the high-end legal community, and to a person, they thought this was just a, a, a laughable case from, from the start. But he was willing to do this. He was willing to tie up 12 people's lives, and the, the juror said, why, why, we, why do we have to do this? This is just a waste of time. I mean, that, that's what they actually said. And, and this massive asshole was willing to waste time of 12 jurors, God knows how many court employees, how many things they had to move on a docket and everything else just to get humiliated, which was going to happen from the beginning. But please just look at a picture of this man. I beg you, and you will understand everything. Yeah, and of course, when I watched Fox News last night, uh, uh, the answer was, well, it was a D.C. jury. What do you expect? Namely, you know, they're blacks. Uh, so, and, and James, just, just to recap for a minute though, the notion, which has taken hold more than it should, that really there wasn't a great deal to the Trump, uh, Russian ties in 2016, that's totally false. We ought to oh. remember, we ought to remember the Senate Intelligence Committee, Robert Mueller, the indi uh, Trump's campaign manager shared polling information with a, uh, a Russian agent. Uh, Roger Stone was notified ahead of times of the Russian-inspired WikiLeaks about Podesta and Hillary Clinton's emails. Jared Kushner and others met with Russians, including one suspected of being an agent in New York in order to dig up dirt on Hillary Clinton. You can debate about whether there should have been more, whether Trump should have been indicted or not. The Justice Department said you can't indict a uh, uh, sitting president. But there is no question there was a Russian effort to, to, and it may have had some success, to affect the 2016 election, and they'll be back. Yeah, see, see the Senate Intelligence Committee report. Okay. I, I mean, come on. But, you know, that 
it, it's of, of course any time that you can inject race into anything, that's that's always the first and default position of Fox News every time. James, um, there's a story this week about Biden and inflation, uh, and an acknowledgement by uh, Treasury Secretary and Federal Reserve that they were slow to recognize the dangers. Uh, they probably should have listened to Larry Summers a year and a half ago. Uh, or a year ago, uh, and uh, we have a real inflation problem now. Biden, by all accounts, is doing whatever he can and doing it fairly well. It's very limited what he can do. One thing that struck me is the stories are saying that Biden was angry or upset with his staff for not preparing him more to do this. The same kind of stories emerged about three or four months ago. Biden was upset with his staff for not preparing him about the Afghanistan withdrawal problems. Well, if he's upset with his staff that much, maybe he ought to think about bringing some new people in uh, because I, it's a pretty hard case to make that they have handled, with the exception of the Ukraine war, to be sure, they've handled all this with, uh, with great skill. So I talked to a lot of people that do focus groups, and basically they come back with the same thing. People don't necessarily blame Biden for inflation as much as you might think. But they think he's too weak to deal with it, all right? The, the Tory parliament in the U.K. passed a windfall profits tax on all companies, all right? Why don't we do that? The, what, who they really blame? They think that these companies, and, and I'm sure that they write, uh, is it 100% the case? Well, no, but it is a lot of the case that they take an advantage of this to raise prices wherever they can, and their profits are, are through the roof, and God damn it, make them vote. Make them vote on a windfall profit tax for these all companies who, who are making money hand over foot on this. And, that, you know, show show people, because people really will kind of de defend him a little bit on the inflation that, that really rather when his fault, there were other factors, they buy into that. They just think that, and they think he would like to do something about it, but he's too weak. And th that's a hard thing to overcome. All right. It really is, but I get that from a lot of different people, and and the results of these focus groups are pretty consistent. James, I would just add to that that uh, I I think it's pretty hard. You can say they were too late, um, too little, uh, I guess. But right now, the policies basically smart people we talk to, like Roger Altman, think the policies are right. Uh, and as you say, people don't necessarily blame him. They just think he's weak. So some of it is what they're conveying. And we know that Janet Yellen, who is probably one of our better Treasury secretaries, that communicating and conveying stuff is not her strength. It's not Joe Biden's strength. It's not anybody's strength there. They have to have somebody there to help Biden who can convey this stuff. And why they resist that, I don't know. Well, I... I yeah, I mean, one of the things that the people that the president has around him, and I've, I've found this to be true of politicians, particularly older politicians, they, they don't like to be handled by new people. Yeah. The people that they feel like they can trust, I, I you know, I, I think is that there'll probably be some kind of a, you know, resetting after the, the fall elections, but if they're going the way they look like they're going, there's going to be a lot to reset here. I mean, I hope... I hope this thing gets turned around between now and November. Yeah, don't wait till after the elections and don't just bring in the old folks who were there for a while and took a brief respite. Think about some new people. I hope uh, I hope they do that. As you know, I've said they need to have a Jennifer Granholm or a Mitch Landry, both for their political savvy, uh, their their adulthood, if you will, and their and their ability to communicate. But there's no bigger admirer than Governor Granholm and Mel Landry and me. So. I, I, for them for anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Hey, James, our guest uh, is one of our favorite guests and one of America's great military leaders, uh, retired Admiral James Stavridis. Uh, he has written a new book, Risk It All, about difficult, courageous decisions made by American sailors. You know, you're so prolific, Admiral, I think we may have to have you on every six months, every time, every time there's, a, there's a new book. Uh, this is really, uh, this is, these stories are interesting. There's an American aircraft carry that's gonna be named for the first time for an enlisted man and an African-American, Dory Miller. Tell us about him. 
Yeah, let's start with just a point of comparison. Uh, almost all our other aircraft carriers are named for white American presidents. So Roosevelt, Lincoln, Washington, et cetera, who are great men and were great leaders in this country. But as you say, Al, the, this one is gonna be named for an African-American petty officer, and his story really is remarkable. Um, he enlists in the Navy in the 1930s when the Navy is segregated and, and quite frankly, very racist. The only rating available to him is to be uh, a, a, a cook, a valet, if you will, to, to the officers. He's literally shining shoes for the officers and cooking their meals. Uh, but he sees it as a way to kind of advance from his hard scrabble life in Texas. So he's on the battleship West Virginia on Pearl Harbor, on the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor, 7 December 41. And he could have stayed at his battle station quite safely inside the ship. He hears the guns, he hears the torpedoes hitting. He runs for the bridge of the ship because he wants to do something. He wants to help. And he begins by grabbing his captain, who is grievously wounded, helping move the captain to medical assistance. Now he's down on one of the main decks. He sees an aircraft gun. Nobody is manning it. Dory Miller simply sits down. A couple of his sailor friends help him figure it out. And he starts shooting. And he shoots down several Japanese Zeros on a day that was otherwise a complete disaster for the United States. He wins the... I should say he's awarded the Navy Cross, the second highest decoration our nation has to offer. Um, he is rightly seen as a hero who literally ran to the sound of the guns. Tragically, two years later, he dies in, in, when the ship he is now on, the Linscombe Bay, is sunk in the Second World War. So a, a real hero in every regard, um, somebody it, who made the hardest of decisions under extreme pressure, did the right thing for his nation. Boy, there's a lot to admire about Dory Miller. USS Dory Miller, a 100,000-ton aircraft carrier. That's a good story. That's an amazing story. And I see there's also a move to try to um, award him uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor uh, in addition to the Navy Cross. I, I, for one, would, would say yes. He is yeah. in that category. Um, he took the ultimate personal risk. Again, the title of the book we're talking about is To Risk It All. Dory Miller truly risked it all. And well, another story you tell, which is both inspiring and it actually makes me very mad, and that's about Captain Brett uh, Crozier, who in March 2020, he was the, uh, the captain on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. I think he had 4,000 sailors uh, on board and COVID broke out and there were a number of cases, and he sent a pleading message to his superiors to rescue them. It was later leaked, and the high command, a second-rate acting Navy secretary named Moldy, and the defense secretary fired Crozier. And you know what, I, I, I admire Crozier a lot, but what upsets me about that story, Admiral, is that the, the, the Navy and the Pentagon seem to care more about its own embarrassment than the safety of those sailors. Indeed, and recall that when Captain Crozier, and I know Brett Crozier, he was uh, one of my shipmates when I was Supreme Allied Commander in NATO. He helped plan the air operations over Libya. He was on a fast track to be an admiral. Uh, when Brett launched that email, and it did get leaked, um, Donald Trump said, who does this guy think he is, Ernest Hemingway? And, and that tells you everything you need to know. It was the embarrassment and it, it caused, in my view, the Navy to make the wrong decision here. And uh, let's all put ourselves back in early 2020 in the pandemic. Nobody knows what's going on. Um, we're still arguing about whether or not to wear a mask. We've got no vaccines, no boosters, no palliatives, no uh, antiviral cures. We have nothing. The only thing Brett Crozier is told by the Navy is socially distance your crew. That's impossible on a warship. Um, I invite you to consider your kitchen, kitchen in a typical American suburban household. On board a ship in a space the size of your kitchen, eight sailors live there. So think about eight adult people living in your kitchen. That, it's impossible to social distance. So what Brett said was, 
We're not at war. I'm not in combat. I request permission to bring the ship into port and take my crew off so we can socially distance them. Closest port is Guam. He makes the case to go there. And eventually, the Navy finally agrees with doing so. But in an act of retribution, essentially, he's relieved for cause. Now, you'll get different views on this from different people, but I have spent a lot of time studying this case. I know Captain Crozier. In my view, he can hold his head very high. He put his crew first, which is the right thing to do when you're not in combat. If that carrier were in combat operations, he should have kept going, fought the ship, got it, but this was not combat operations. I think Brett Crozier made the right decision. When he was relieved, I think you're right, Admiral, he was cheered by his crew. Uh, you know, he was he cheered by thousands of his crew right. members who gathered on the flight deck to watch him take his last stride down the brow. Um, his crew got it right. In my view, the Navy got it wrong. I'll leave some of the old timers like uh, Admiral Farragut to an old timer like James Carville. But I want to ask you about one person who's not in the book because I know he's one of your heroes. And that's Admiral Chester Nimitz, who uh, uh, F FDR put in charge of uh, the war in the Pacific and World War II. James and I are fascinated by that theater. My dad spent more than three years as a naval officer over there. What sort of a leader was Chester Nimitz? He was the, the absolute epitome of what an officer should be. My, my father, who is a career Marine, that one's for you, James Carvel. My, <laughs> my father, who is a Marine uh, colonel, used to say to me constantly, the job of an officer is to bring order out of chaos. And that's what Chester Nimitz did everywhere he went. He was low key. He was a team builder. He was happy to see others get credit. He could make personalities like Bull Halsey and Douglas MacArthur, picture being sandwiched around those two, he could make them work together beautifully. Um, he did it all by something Colin Powell used to say, which is you can get anything done if you're willing not to get credit for it. That is the kind of person Chester Nimitz was. Came out of a small town in Texas. If you two are both fascinated, you've probably already done this, but go to Fredericksburg, Texas, outside of Austin and San Antonio, go to the Museum of the War of the Pacific. It's also Fredericksburg, Texas, from whence Chester Nimitz came. Well, He's a Jay very special officer. James, Let me answer I'm, a question I'm, that, that you kind of posed, which is, so why is he not in the book, Stavridis? Right. Two reasons. One is, I already wrote about him in a previous right, no, book did. called Sailing True North, Ten Admirals in the Voyage of Character. So I wanted some new characters. But also, his level of decision-making was so superb that, in essence, it, it was too good for a book like this because what you want is some really difficult decisions that don't go well and some ups and some downs. That's really the, the characters I chose for this book. Nimitz, in my view, he's, he's the officer in history I would most like to serve under. James, I'm gonna turn it over to you, but this reminds me that one of our other favorite guests, Naval Academy historian, uh, Craig Simon's biography yeah. of Nimitz is out this week. So we have to get Craig back on this uh, on this program, James. Take it over, uh, uh, well, Corporal First of all, Carville. a real quick one. Whose Nimitz did you like better, Henry Fonda or Woody Harrelson? By 1,000 country miles, I like Henry Fonda. I think he got Me it exactly too. right. I Me think too. Woody was okay. Part of it is, you know, you 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 have a persona in your head of Woody Harrelson. Um, I, I think Fonda is just so cool. And I, by the way, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm working on a novel about the war in the Pacific. And one of the things I did was go back and watch the movie In Harm's Way, John uh, Wayne. Right, and yeah. that's the movie in which uh, Fonda plays Nimitz. And, and by the way, that movie really holds up well. Right. So, Admiral, I, I have a little bit of a, you know, E-4's view of the, 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 the armed forces. And it seems to me the Navy is having some problems with personnel. Morale, I think desertions are up. There are really some, what seems some horrific living conditions for sailors on, on, on aircraft carriers in port and getting retrofitted. Is, am I correct, and I, I kind of read the Navy Times like once a week, just check in. Am I correct in saying that there seems to be an inordinate amount of morale issues in the Navy right now? You are correct, and I'll add another that you did not mention, but as part of this package is a rash of suicides in the carrier George Washington. Now, that may be a ship 
specific problem, but when you lay it alongside all the other things you've mentioned, um, it, it is a very concerning fact pattern. And, and I think a significant part of it is the overload on a limited number of ships. We only have about 300 ships in the US Navy. We've got missions, legitimate forward missions for 350, maybe 375 ships. That analysis has been borne out again and again and again. So uh, what happens? The demand signal for those existing ships is inordinately high. Deployments stretch out. Many Americans may not know that you know, these forever wars are ending and our brave Army and Air Force are coming home and going back to garrisons. For the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps, they continue to deploy at sea. They're away from their families six months, seven months, eight months at a crack. That leads to morale problems, mental health problems. I think the Navy has some work to do. So, Tim, I, I want to get you, and I, I know you've spoken on this, but General Berger, who's the Commandant of the Marine Corps, is actually a Tulane grad, has sort of tried to redefine the mission of the Marine Corps. And in what I thought was highly unusual, Admiral Zuni and, uh, Ad, I mean, General Zuni and General Krulak and another general took out a, after him in a piece in the New York Times, yeah. which is, to me, is highly unusual to have retired general officers uh, criticizing the, the current commandant. I mean, a commandant in the Marine Corps has an iconic place. He's more like a pope than, yeah. than anything <laughs> else. Could you explain to me and to our audience exactly what are the parameters of this debate and what is General Berger trying to do and what are they trying to stop General Berger from doing? Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll stipulate at the beginning, I'm a big fan of what General Berger is doing. And I think uh, he's actually going about it in the, the best way that can possibly be. His view is that we are entering an era of great power competition, and that means we need a Marine Corps that is less focused on the kind of fight we've been on, which is in the desert against irregular forces, the Afghan and the Iraqi scenarios where our Marines fought incredibly bravely and incredibly well, in my view. But General Berger, I think, correctly sees that the next round of combat, God forbid, is going to be with China and Russia. And, you know, see paragraph one about what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, and could that happen in the Straits of Taiwan, for example, in the South China Sea? So Berger's vision is get away from the heavy artillery, the heavy tanks, make the Marine Corps lighter, faster, more lethal, give them more unmanned vehicles, more portable systems, train them to operate behind the first and second island chains, which are basically lines of defense and offense in the South China Sea. And I think he's got it right. Now, very senior officers, and I'll stipulate General Zinni has been a, a mentor to me for 20 years. I have enormous regard for him. Uh, general Krulak, of course, is a former commandant. The third general is Van Ripper, who's one of the leading thinkers uh, of, of his generation in the Marine Corps. They feel the Marine Corps still needs those heavy artillery, heavy tanks, uh, be able to fully integrate w in combined arms operations with the Army. I think that uh, Berger has this one right. There are going to be pushback from a lot of older, more senior Marines. But I think, James, I'll conclude with this, I think it's a return to the Marine Corps that you saw in the Second World War. Uh, light, fast, on its feet. And by the way, the Army is looking at what the Marine Corps is doing and what the Commandant is doing. And I'll tell you something, I think the Army of tomorrow is going to look a lot like the Marine Corps that the Commandant is putting together now. Before I, I let you go, would you please explain to us the doctrine of strategic ambiguity as it relates? To, <laughs> because that sounds like a, a constipated term, but actually at some level it makes some sense. <laughs> It does, actually, and, and it, it is one of those kind of impenetrable terms, but that's the point of it. So it applies to Taiwan, the island of Taiwan, and the strategic ambiguity is that the United States has been deliberately ambiguous about whether or not we would come militarily to the defense of Taiwan. In other words, if China attacked the island of Taiwan with the United States, 
send carriers? Would we send fighters? Would we effectively go to war with China to defend the island of Taiwan? The reason we implemented that goes back to uh, decades ago when we recognized China as, as the one power. And this is uh, another fairly impenetrable term, but it's the one China policy, which simply means the United States says that China is the sovereign state of China and Taiwan is in an ambiguous state. But what we do say about Taiwan in the Taiwan Relations Act is that we would view it with grave concern if China used military action to subdue the island of Taiwan and that we will provide capability to the Taiwanese to defend themselves. How much capability is a matter of some debate. I think that in today's era of great power competition, you're going to see the United States provide more and better capability to Taiwan so they can defend themselves much as the Ukrainians are defending themselves. Strategic ambiguity, bottom line, it simply is created to make it a little more difficult for China to make a decision. Uh, personally, I think it's time we started moving a little bit away from that and thought more about um, making a commitment to Taiwan. How you craft that, what you say about it remains to be seen. I'll, I'll finish with this. The president, President Biden, at a press conference about a week ago said that his, essentially, I'll put words in his mouth, his inclination was that we would defend Taiwan. It's the third time he said something like that. I think that goes beyond the gaff meter and probably is becoming pretty close to a, a deliberate effort to strengthen our policy toward Taiwan. Good, Al. Admiral, you, you know, your, pre your previous book was one of our favorite novels, 2034. It was about a miscalculation leading to an American-China war. As you look at the situation today, are you more or less worried about that prospect than you were when you wrote that novel? I'm going to surprise you here, I would guess, and tell you I'm less concerned. Uh, about China making a move on Taiwan. And the reason is because of what Russia has done, President Xi, put yourself in his shoes for a minute. He's watching what's happening in Ukraine. Number one, he's thinking, are my generals as bad as those Russian generals? Number two, he's saying, I wonder if those Taiwanese might put up a fight like those Ukrainians. Maybe they're being inspired by them. Number three, he's looking at the unity on the part of the West in sanctioning Russia. He's thinking, man, I don't want any of that. Um, recognizing that sanctioning China is a whole different level of activity than sanctioning Russia. But it's creating doubt in his mind. And I think that that has a calming effect on the waters. And number two, Al, this year, toward the end of the year, President Xi will be standing for election, I, I think that's a stretch, but that's one way to categorize it, to be for the third term, third five-year term. That would put him in the pantheon with Mao and with Deng, and it would, it, he wants a relatively calm stretch of time here. So don't, don't look for China to make a big move, I'd say over the next 12 to 18 months. We're in for a year of living quietly with China as a result of all that. Well, that's actually reassuring. Uh, you've also written that the next front in the Ukraine war will be the Black Sea. And yeah. that NATO can send ships into those Ukrainian waters and international waters. Would, would that be a real escalation? It would be a significant escalation. And there's a way to do it which would reduce the chances of an unintended uh, rocket ride to conflict between Russia and NATO. Um, Let's start with Putin's strategy. He's taking a page from Abraham Lincoln. He's using the anaconda strategy of the Civil War to effectively choke off Ukraine. Uh, fortunately for the Ukrainians, they have big land borders to allies, which, of course, the South did not. But uh, Putin wants to choke off that seacoast. He's got a big Black Sea fleet, about 40 warships, a lot of capability out there at sea. So at the moment, he's succeeding. Um, essentially goods are not moving in and out. The concern for the world, of course, is that Ukraine is a huge breadbasket, notably for North Africa and the Middle East. We, the world, need that grain to come out 
or we're going to have instability in those regions. We'll have massive uh, discontinuities in global food supplies. So what should we do? As opposed to sending a couple of aircraft carriers and, you know, the U.S. 6th Fleet up there and, you know, going nose to nose with the Russians, here's, here's what I would propose. We send some American destroyers, some British destroyers. They team up with Turkish, Bulgarian, and Romanian warships that are already there. And we say, we're going to escort these grain shipments in and out. We're not going to allow weapons to come in through this route. We're going to move grain out and move empty ships in. That is non-confrontational. By the way, we'd have to do some mine clearance because both the Russians and the Ukrainians have put mines in the water. We can do all that. We can put that together in the matter of two or three weeks if we had to. And the three of us are old enough to remember the last time we did something like this. It was the 1980s, the tanker wars in the Arabian Gulf, when the Iranians tried to close the Strait of Hormuz to create leverage. The United States and our allies said, oh no, we're going to escort those ships in and out. It was called Earnest Will, Operation Earnest Will. And a very young Lieutenant Commander Stavridis with a great head of hair at that time was the <laughs> operations officer on one of those cruisers. We know how to do this. We can do it. We ought to do it. Let me ask you a final question about Ukraine. You know, Pre President Biden got a lot of criticism for the way he handled the withdrawal of forces in Afghanistan. There were charges of incompetence. Assess his competence in the handling of the Ukraine crisis. I'd give him high marks. And uh, additionally, I think his team has, has, has played the field very, very well. Here I'm talking about Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, and Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense. Um, they work together back to the Nimitz model. They're not seeking to score points. They're not trying to be out front on anything. They're building smart plans. And above all, they're working with our allies. Three principal things I think they've done extremely well knit the allies together, notably NATO. And by the way, the encouragement of Sweden and Finland to join NATO, excellent. So diplomacy. Number two, economically, I've been very pleasantly surprised at how the Europeans have hung together on what are going to be some tough sanctions for them to take in oil and ultimately in gas. That's happening because of a lot of encouragement and back office work by the United States to help replace those hydrocarbons. And number three, militarily, uh, you know, my wheelhouse, we have put the right tools at the right time in the hands of the Ukrainians. Um, I think we've been slightly late in a couple instances. I was uh, very happy today to see these MLRSs, uh, multi-launch rocket systems, basically surface-to-surface 50-mile -surface missiles. Those are going to flow in. Very good move. Um, the only quibble I would have is MiG-39s. I wish the administration had given the Ukrainians the Polish MiG-39s that were on offer. That may come uh, before this is all over. But overall, I'd say uh, two thumbs up. The president's done a good job and his team has done a good job for him. You'd probably add Bill Burns to that list of uh, the I team, would. would. Thank you yeah. for that correction. Yeah. And Bill Burns is a, a wonderful friend. He would love it that I didn't mention him because he, <laughs> he is the one that always likes to be in the, in the back of the picture. Like the French say, he was never in the picture. But Bill Burns, our leading expert on Russia, and, and to the degree we're going to have a back channel and try and sort this thing out in some way, uh, Bill Burns will be right in the middle of it. Thank you for adding him. James. So, so Admiral, in, in the, I, I just have this theory that the Russians traditionally have a really crappy Navy. I mean, they got <laughs> slaughtered in 1905. And we were the build up. The Reagan administration was saying we need a 600-ship Navy at the time because the Russian Navy is so powerful. Of course, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, there were nothing but a bunch of rust buckets. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I looked at that, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the, the Moscow or Muscovia, or whatever they called it. Moscow. You couldn't get that ship within 100 miles of the U.S. Navy. It, it, it was kind of refitted something or other. It, it just was a, what didn't strike me as a, a, a very potent naval vessel in it. That was their flagship. Am I justified in me thinking that they're not very good sailors? <laughs> yeah. I think your sight picture is spot on. And 
And let me tell you, the first thing they teach you at Annapolis is never let them sink your flagship. Okay, that's like uh, lesson one in Annapolis. And, and here's the Moskva, which is a big, imposing looking ship. But if you look at it on the sides of it, it's got cruise missiles along the sides of the ship. Think about that for a minute. The, all that ammunition, all that explosive uh, capability is outside the skin of the ship. It's a, it's a big grape waiting to get squashed. And that's what the Ukrainians did with the Neptune missile. And, and therefore, the Moskva is now a, a hulk on the bottom of the Black Sea and probably 500 sailors killed. Um, so they're, they're very bad in their, in their ethos generally. But James, there are two things they're very good at at sea. Uh, one is submarines. Their submarines are not quite as good as ours, but very, very close. Quiet, lethal, well handled. They have strong tradition in that area. And their, their second capability that I think is, is worth highlighting is their um, long range uh, cruise missiles like those on the Moskva. They're very capable and they are moving their hypersonic missiles to sea. Those are less of a concern for exactly the reasons we're talking about. We can find them and kill them on the surface. Where I worry about Russian maritime activity is submarines. So before I let you go, I got to ask you this because now we see Finland and Sweden wanting to join NATO and be part of it. And as I read about Sweden and Finland, they, they both have something to bring to the table here. I mean, their militaries are not anything to sneeze at. I, mean, I think the Swedes have some, some pretty advanced stuff, and the Finns are, are maybe the most clever people on Earth. <laughs> I mean, they'd be pretty good allies, wouldn't they? A hundred percent correct, and, and I'll put a little specificity on it. Uh, think of Finland, and this is perhaps counterintuitive, but Finland is a land power in this sense. They're, while they're a small country, population maybe five million, they can legitimately put one million soldiers in the field because they have universal conscription. They have mandatory two-week training for essentially the entire adult population, and they know how to fight. They fought the Russians, the Soviets, to a standstill in 1939. Google Winter War Finland, 1939. It's a pretty inspirational story, not unlike what you're seeing today. They have more artillery pieces than any other nation in Europe. So they're wow ground centric. Sweden, on the other hand, your point is high tech. Their Gripen fighter is an absolute equivalent, highly competitive with the US Hornet, the fifth generation, our current high end fighter before the new joint strike fighter really gets on track. Um, at arms sales around the world, people compare the Gripen and the US Hornet. And I watched those Gripens. Look, I've commanded these troops. Uh, in Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, what those Gripens can do, I, I, I didn't believe it um, in terms of their avionics, their pilot skills, precision of their attack. They also make terrific ships, very high-end diesels. Look, if you can make Volvo sports cars, you can make high-end military stuff. Um, they, they are a nice pair of horses for the alliance. And last thing, James, geography. They give us that whole northern reach. It, it complicates Putin's military problems immensely, and it's a window into the Arctic, which is another huge plus for the alliance in terms of surveillance and engagement. Uh, you know, if they want to get into NATO, we should be we should do everything we can to get them in, and, and that means getting past these, in my view, faux objections that Turkey is raising. We'll get through those. Watch for them to join NATO by the late summer. Bravo. Thank you so much, Admiral. How you got anything you want to add? I'm, I'm, I'm just in awestruck here. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the, the good thing is we can have him back frequently because he's so <laughs> prolific. We'll be having another book coming out soon. Uh, you know, I can't thank you enough, Admiral. This has just been great. And for everybody out there, the book is To Risk It All, uh, Nine Heroic Stories, my favorite still is Dory Miller, but uh, you'll, you'll love all nine. Uh, Admiral, be safe, and we hope to talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And James, yes, Semperfy. Semperfy. Thank you, Admiral.
All right, now the questions from our very smart listeners. There are a whole bunch of gun questions, James. Let me start with Rebecca from Louisville, Kentucky. When it comes to violence, gun violence, why are we the only country that does nothing, at least the only first world country that does nothing? Why? Mm -hmm. Well, well, we did something. Okay, let's stop. In 1994, a bill authored by then-Senator Joe Biden, completely supported by then-President Bill Clinton, passed an assault weapons ban. At the time that that assault weapons ban passed, there were 400,000 of these assault weapons in the United States. In 2004, under the administration of President Bush, that ban was repealed. Today, there are over 20 million. I don't know why you haven't heard about that, but I, I, I can't understand when, when everybody said, we actually did something, and it just it wasn't done that long ago, and it was undone. And I cannot, it, it, but no one needed this. In 19, 2000, 1999, people were hunting, people were going to gun clubs, people were having marksmanship, and most people do not realize this, and I have no idea why, but it could be one of the most disastrous decisions. It, it was done. It was, you had something, and, and you, it expanded the Brady Bill, and crime had dropped precipitously between 1994 and 2004. But I, for some reason, the, that story is being kept from the public, and I don't understand it. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm sure that the Biden people are saying, well, don't talk about that. That's retrospective. I, I, I don't know why people are, are, are uninformed about this, but I'll, I'll leave that to people smarter than me. But we actually did something, and we did something significant. And people can say, well, they should have made it permanent. Well, they needed the goddamn votes. All right, and I guess they, you know, they said, "Well, we'll give you we'll give you this in ten years." And of course, they got a Republican president, and they didn't reauthorize it. And it would have been an easy thing to do, easy thing to do, and it worked. It worked. The crime bill, in many aspects, worked. People need to get over it. The next question comes from Richard in uh, in Roseville, Minnesota. Richard said, ask, was Beto O'Rourke's interrupting Governor Abbott's news conference at the tragic scene in Uvalde, Texas, a wise move or not? Yes, it was a wise move. This is the time you have to confront. Abbott has a dreadful record, not just on guns, but on mental health. Beto O'Rourke is running behind. I thought that was a long shot at best, probably out of reach. I'm not so sure now. I thought that was a good start. I think the gun issue and the mental health issue are issues that even in Texas may not play to Governor Abbott's strength. And I would still consider O'Rourke an underdog, but I think that was a good start. And I think he ought to be aggressive from now until November. Well, they talk about how it wasn't well-mannered for him to interrupt a press conference. Or what would a man as some asshole shooting 19 kids and two teachers? Right? <laughs> I think that that act it required something of this nature, and I agree with you. I think uh, uh, O'Rourke did a, 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 a really thing, and, and that, that's where he is. I mean, you, you knew that coming in, that's in his heart. It's something needed to be done. And, you know, he did something, and the something he did, I think, was, was called for at the moment. I agree. Next, Dave in Seattle, Washington, James, wants to know, what are the positive upsides for Democrats in 2024 if in the midterms Republicans take the House Democrats keep the Senate. There are no big lies, Secretary of State, and the economy is in good condition. Well, the first thing we should do is, you know, you probably want to look at 2024 and 2022, but if you want to do that, go look at the 2024 Senate map. It's shitty. The 2022 Senate map is much better. So we, we better do everything we can to hold the Senate because even if we have a decent year to win the presidency, I—, I, I it's quite possible we could lose Senate seats. Um, I, you know, with, you know, with, look, uh, we had a terrible 94, one in 96. Obama had a well, terrible 2010 and one in uh, 2012. Uh, you know, this, this historically has happened before, but uh, I'm, I'm, I think we got to try to do whatever we can to mitigate the effects of this 19, this 2022. But uh, I, I, I 
think overall, given everything that's happened in the country, I, I fully expect that we, we could have a, a good, at least presidential in the House 2024. The Senate map is not good. Not good. Well, I'll tell you what else worries Democrats, that Joe Biden's going to be 82. Uh, that's, that's tough. Kamala Harris uh, has not grown in the job, apparently. She's certainly not going to scare anyone off. And there is no Bill Clinton or Barack Obama seemingly uh, in the wings. So, um, you know, it's a long way off. Well, a lot can happen in uh, a year and a half. But, um, you know, the Democrats um, you know, could have a candidate problem. In 1990, you know, no one, you know, Bill Clinton was at 2006, Barack Obama, okay? He was saying, I remember it was all the dwarfs and everything. And people of this talent tend to explode and emerge when they get on the stage. And I think they are, yeah, assuming that there's a wide open contest for the Democratic nomination in 2024. And I think they're going to see that there's a lot of talented people waiting in the wings. Uh, here is, this is from Saket in Baltimore, Maryland. God, Saket, I love this question. He said, he, he's been a huge fan of, of both of us since the 1990s when he watched Capital oh. Gang and Crossfire. Mr. Hunt oh, also wow. spoke at my college graduation at Johns Hopkins in 2001. Uh, oh, my. And he says, while I love you guys, personally, my politics were always with Robert Novak. Can each of you <laughs> kindly share your favorite memory of Robert Novak? He is a legend. The Prince oh. of Darkness was a legend. Uh, I disagree with him on everything, not just politics and taxes, uh, but also on basketball and the weather and everything else. He was a dear friend. Uh, I used to love to go around to college campuses with him. Uh, he used to say that uh, when my wife, who was Judy Woodruff, was White House correspondent for NBC, when we got married, we both had roles in journalism and we talked about our names and she kindly consented to let me keep my maiden name. That was one of the nicer things that Bob Novak ever said. But God, he was a force and I miss him. Yeah, yeah I did. I did. Uh, I did cross out with him. I, I must have done, I don't know, 25, 30 speeches with him. And he was actually more charming than he was irritating. And let me tell you, he was really irritating. Yeah. That, that's, not, that's not a throwaway line. But the one thing about Bob was, for everything else, he was a real sports fan. I mean, <laughs> that guy, you know, literally went to every game of any kind of thing. I mean, he loved Maryland basketball. Travel with the team. He, he, yeah, travel with the team. Uh, you know, he followed everything. He was uh, he was a charming guy, I, and it, it, it's kind of hard just to watch him. And I I, I don't know if his, if his how, how much of his thing he really believed. I think he did believe a good bit of it. He wasn't very high on democracy. wasn't very high on worker rights, anything like Certainly that. Certainly high but on low was, taxes for people who were well he, off. And so, uh, yeah. he wasn't very high on Israel, and it. it his stance on Israel cost him a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it did. Um, you know, I'll tell you something else uh, about him, though. He could spot phonies. Uh, he always knew uh, that Newt Gingrich was a phony. Uh, I continue to believe he would have known that Donald Trump uh, was a phony. Now, he would have loved Donald Trump's tax cuts. Uh, I think that's what separates him from the Laura Ingrams and the, uh, and the Sean Hannity's of the world. But anyway, he was a force. Uh, the next question comes from Robin, who's living rurally north of New Orleans. She doesn't say where. Or he, I'm not sure if it's a he or a she. Uh, she probably is on the North Shore in St. Tammany. Yeah. Or maybe she volunteered. For, well, this is, you're right. She volunteered for the St. Tammany's Parish Democratic Party in 2018 to 20 time frame. In short, the volunteers did not understand the difference between mobilizing for a one-time event and organizing. How can that happen? What are our institutions doing? How can we get better? And yet yeah, this is a question, amazingly enough, that I've been sort of having conversations with about what the DNC should be. And I had a, a, a talk with a young man. She gave me my phone number yesterday, a, a young guy, Wessel. His dad's a friend of yours, and I've been knowing him for a while. And we just got into this discussion, and the state parties, there's so much, so many, there's some that are really good. There are more that are really, really bad. I, I think they should rethink their thing, and I think the DNC should be a grant making organization. That in order for state parties to get grants, they have to do X, Y, and Z. 
And, of course, the one that always stands out, we got to get him on. Maybe we're talking about having a political guest next week because people, our, our viewers, you know, is, is the Wisconsin party chairman, who is by yeah. every estimation the best or one of the top three best. But I, I, I think the entire mission of the DNC has to be re rethought. James, and James, I think they are falling so far behind the RNC. There was a story in Politico today by Heidi Prisbella that talked about all the things the RNC mainly to try to intimidate voters, to try to do a whole lot of things. They also were working on Secretary of State races, uh, Supreme Court races. Uh, there are other people who raise the money, but the RNC directs channels, uh, and I don't think the DNC does much of that. And I, 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 I think it's a real, it's a real lost leader, and. Uh, it's, we're going to pay a price if that doesn't change. But it, it's historic, and I have some historical perspective here because my wife was chief of staff of the RNC, and I used to go to events. I know something, a little something about their culture. And the, the truth of the matter is most Democratic consultants just don't even think of the DNC. It's, it's just an afterthought. And I, I, I just think that, you know, our – tendency being Democrats is to centralize, you know, have a kind of top-down thing. And I think it's some things that works. I'm not a you have Social Security and, uh, you know, infrastructure bill and things like that. But I, I just think in bottom American politics that there has to be a real effort to strengthen these state parties, particularly, in, you know, and as our friend in St. Tammany pointed out, you know, about organizing and mobilizing. And I, you know, and again, and I think we need to rethink the whole progressive advocacy groups and we need to get people the hell out of Washington and out in the States. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad this question came up and it just, it's just something that's been on my mind and I'm going to make it my business to talk to some pretty influential people about reorienting, and I don't even know what the mission is now, and never did. We were lucky we had Ron Brown. Was probably well, James, I was going to say, the DNC has not always been irrelevant to all those people. With Ron Brown, with Paul Kirk. Paul uh, Kirk. I mean, I mean, okay, uh, this that, is that's, a, that, Al, that's 35 years ago. Well, <laughs> yeah, but James, there's no re I mean, I'm sorry. If the RNC can be engaged in stuff we may not like but effective, there's no, I mean, I, I don't know what the role is, but as far as I can see, it's basically nothing. And that I, is a problem. I, I agree. I'm trying to think our way out. I think it should, my suggestion is it should basically be a place that, that coordinates technology and gives out grants. I, I agree. I'm not, you know. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, I, I'm we, not disagreeing We have a follow-up yeah. question, really, or it's a, it's a cousin, first cousin from Scott and Hyannis. Uh, Scott says, with the midterms fast approaching, I feel the Democrats have a real shot in Ohio. Tim Ryan is a practical, no-nonsense guy who is in it for the American middle-class worker. How do we push a Democrat like this over the top? You know something, Scott? You are right. There was a poll out that showed Vance three points ahead of, 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 of Tim Ryan. Uh, too big and undecided. And then there was somebody from the DSCC, a spokesman, saying, you know, we're really not going to invest in reach races like that. Well, I'll tell you something. When James Carville talks about how bad the map is in 2024, uh, and if you look at the fact that they could lose one or two incumbents, maybe not, they better reach out to the reach candidates in, in Ohio and in Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Wisconsin because what their goal ought to be is not to try to hold on to 50-50, but to try to get 52 or 53 Democratic senators. That's not going to be easy. But to say we're not going to, not going to invest in reach candidates like Tim Ryan is insane, James. I, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I, I think I might be have some complicity in this because I, I start out that we, we got to quit being emotional and, and be more targeted and go to Secretary of State's Attorney General's races and, you know, quit worrying about trying to beat Mitch McConnell or Marjorie Taylor Greene, et cetera, et cetera. I certainly did not mean that in a Senate race in North Carolina or a Senate race in Ohio, where you have, you know, how you do have an incumbent Democratic Senate, I would point out, and you got a particularly egregious nominee that had a particularly bruising primary, uh, and we have a particularly effective candidate. And I think the same thing is true in, in North Carolina. We have a, we have a very good candidate. And th those are, maybe you would call them reach. I, I, I don't know. I think they, I would call them in range. All right. Maybe even toss But, but there's a lot of difference between the North Carolina Senate race, which hell, we almost won the last cycle, and, and, and 
Georgia 14 or Kentucky or Tennessee or something like that. So uh, I hope that m my critique is not being misunderstood. I'm not for, for just for, and I, I know what's happening is the four incumbents, which are all must holes, you know, they're saying, you know, you can't, you got to give us the, 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 what we call somebody text me. It's the only time anybody on a podcast, I'm talking about 441 AD money. But I, they're going to have enough money, and they've got to they've got to try to do everything they can to do as well as they can in the Senate in 22, because it, it I don't think it's going to be pretty in 2024. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, most of those incumbents like Warnock and Kelly, they are, they are fantastic fundraisers. Uh, they're going to have every bit as many dollars as they need for that race. Uh, but, right. you know, places like Ohio and North Carolina and, uh, and maybe Wisconsin— uh, are going to need it more. And so uh, in reach, Florida, Democrats Florida, reach. We're already, and Wisconsin, we, you know, we should be able to win. Well, absolutely. That I mean, Ron Johnson has probably the worst standing, poll standings of any incumbent senator. He's a fool. And the question is, can Democrats nominate uh, someone who's more attractive and I, can beat him? I hope so. I, I wouldn't, I just, it's a difference between a reach and being in range. Mm-hmm. Right. I think Ohio and North Carolina and Florida, Florida are in range races. And certainly Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, although Pennsylvania, yes. Lord knows what's going to happen in Pennsylvania. Right. Of course. It's so screwed up right now. Um, David in Livingston, New Jersey says, wouldn't it be logical to put the defunding police attacks to bed by putting a police funding bill together with gun control restrictions like red flag rules, background checks, limits on automatic cartridges, and raise the age to buy automatic weapons. Toss that out. Let Republicans vote against that. James, that's a pretty damn attractive package. It is. I think they've done a lot of this. I think Biden has increased funding and has just publicly said some of these funds they have are, are, are really available to police departments throughout the country. James, do people know uh, that? No, I agree. I, that's, again, that's the problem. But when you have a plurality of people thinking that no jobs have been created under Joe Biden's presidency, you know, once once people make a judgment that this president has failed, they assume that everything has failed. They have, in in he's the most non-defund the police guy. Go back to the '94 crime bill. Right? I mean, Joe Biden has a spectacular record on crime, and he's done a lot now, and he's hardly embraced defund the police. But at any rate, uh, they have done, as I understand it, a pretty damn good bit in terms of funding uh, police around the country. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you're right, but I, I think as they try to put together a gun control right. package to toss in some extra money, however they do it, for police, it also gives a lie to the, to the canard, the Democrats, for defunding the police. And, they're, and, and they're, the other thing it does, you can do that. And the one criticism is say, well, you hadn't done anything yet. Now you're grandstanding. And then you say, no, actually we have. Right, right. I mean, you, when, when, the one thing about in politics, it, 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 I, I tell people it's like playing tennis. What are you going to do when the serve comes back to you? Because they're always going to hit it back. You're not going to you're you're not going to have a, a serve, and the other side is going to say, "Well, shit, I, I can't hit that." Let, you know, just let it go. They're always going to hit it back to you. And you notice these guys are obviously not a tennis player, but it's a big it's a big match. I'll watch it, and they're in position for the return. So when you put this out, you already know the first thing they're going to say. It's no secret. It's go to the playbook. Well, it's election year. Now I want to do something about it. Right. <laughs> All right, you know that. Then you, you then you come in for the kill, right? Right. Um, well, uh, keep those questions coming in. They really are good. We'll, we get to as many as we can, and if we didn't get to yours this week, send in it again, and we'll try to get to it next week. Hey, James, it's not true that Republicans don't have an explanation for the murder of 19 little children and two teachers in New Dalby, Texas last week. Uh, but guess what, James? It has nothing to do with guns or the assault gun used by the killer. Donald Trump Jr. says, hey, those kids could have been killed by a baseball bat. A baseball bat. You can see why they keep little Donnie away from any responsibilities. Ted Cruz says, simple answer is, schools should just have one door 
only one door. Probably, you know, problem is multiple doors. I guess Ted figures if there's a fire like he did, everybody can go to Cancun. And then Arizona's Paul Gosar said the killer was an illegal alien transgender. I mean, he just got it all in there. Of course, none of it was true, but nothing this disturbed congressman says is true. This all would be farcical, except for the fact that 19 precious little children were taken from us. That apparently is irrelevant to the gun apologists who want to make politics out of this tragedy. It's more than an outrage. It's despicable. Well, mine is this, and it's predictable, but not many people know about it. But it's out, they've always said, Trump and Fox, that the FBI and the Obama administration were outing people for political gains and, you know, talking about General Flynn and other people like that. And so, of course, fat-ass Barr decides that he's going to really investigate this, and he's put a guy named John Bash in charge of the investigation. Just so you know, John Bash was the Trump-appointed uh, U.S. attorney for the Western District of Texas, was a clerk for both Justice Scalia and Justice Kavanaugh. He married a woman who was Justice Kavanaugh's clerk, okay? Let's just say he's not a D.C. jury. Of course, Mr. Bash concluded definitively that no such thing happened. Of course, the report was buried, and it was, and everybody kind of forgot about it and moved on. BuzzFeed actually had the good sense to have a FOIA request and got hold to the report, and it said, of course, exactly what you would think it would say, that there is no evidence that anybody did anything like this. But for some, you know, I, I, I know that Fox will sweep it under the rug. I, I have no doubt about that. The, the, this will have never happened. I, I just hope that other people make this public is just an example. And by the way, using the Justice Department to investigate a, a what everyone knew was a baseless political claim, and it, it, that investigation is ordered, I think, sometimes in 2020. And they never told you. They just said there was no national security reason for, for Bill Barr or anybody else to not make this public. I don't know why uh, uh, Garland's people didn't make it public. Maybe there's good reason. But I guess they okay to file your request. I'll give them credit for that. But, but this is, to me, this is such an illustrative story of the way these people operate and how Barr was willing to do anything he could to politicize the Justice Department. And I, I also blame the press a little bit for not following up. I think there's a, a more significant story than it's being given credit for. I mean, this is just really targeting, if by any stretch of the imagination, is putting a partisan zealot in charge of a partisanly zealot op investigation that you kept the results of that investigation away from the public. I, I think it's disgusting. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, I agree, and he was a partisan zealot. But um, cool. that's what we would expect. <laughs> Look him up. Yeah. John Bash, I did. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carvel. And I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.